you know, in the early days of our Christianity, we used to sing, sing really simple songs. One of them is, uh, you are the father, we are the clay, mold me and make me after thy will, while I am yielded, uh, why I'm quiet, yielded, and still. Um, remember that one? Yeah, yeah. okay, good. I, I like that song. I think it's very biblical and sweet. And, um, you know, I'm going to go through uh, the Beatitudes again. I've done them periodically, come back to them, but uh, because of some things that happened this week when uh, the Lord, I believe, was giving me insights uh, I'd never had before, that uh, he wanted me to do this. But I wanted you to see this verse. I think it's really quite amazing. Um, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are the work of your hand. Now, you know, um, Ephesians 2.10 says, we're his workmanship, the words poema, where we get the word poem, we're his letter of love, so to speak. But... um, uh, being that, you know, in their day it was, you know, we're, you're the potter, we're the clay, and, you know, you're working, you know, like this, and, you know, working the clay and stuff, and so you feel pressure and those kind of things. It's the holy hand of God conforming you into the image of his son. So I wanted you to see that. So let's go to the Beatitudes now, starting at 5.3. And I've taught on this before, but um, it came a little differently. And uh, where I'm going is this. Um, Jesus is teaching here how to be the light of the world and how to be a full, full measure of a son of God. Because it ends up saying that blessed are the meek. Now, Moses, according to Numbers 12.3, was the meekest man on the earth. And it says, we'll go there later, but it says that God chose him and then he said, You know, to the prophets, I speak to them through dreams and visions, but not with Moses. I speak to him face to face. Face to face. Why? Because he was meek and he was humble. The Greek words or the Hebrew words in that case are humble and and meek. They're pretty much interchangeable sometimes. But I'll deal with meek in the New Testament. Jesus used that word. But in Numbers, they use the word, usually it's meek, sometimes it's translated humble. But he said that, you know, I dealt with Isaiah. I mean, these are the great prophets of God. And Isaiah did see God, and the other prophets did. But he singled out, this is before they even came along, but he singled out Moses and said, that's the guy I talk to directly face to face. Why? Because you'll find out he was the meekest man, the most humble man on the whole earth. So that's, that should be our goal, you know? I was telling you <clears throat> a few weeks ago that in um, Ephesians 1 through 3, Paul says some of the most amazing things to us. He says that we're, you know, going to be adopted into sonship. That's the actual word there, not adopted as children. You're not adopted. You're born again from above by God. You're not adopted. You have the DNA of God. Adoption doesn't do that. But you're born from above by the power of the Holy Spirit. But it says that you are placed as a son, a mature son. That's the actual word there. And um, then he goes on to say that you're seated in heavenly places and all these things. And then he starts out, he says, now as a prisoner in jail, in a prison, a terrible place, I mean worse than a jail cell, some of his incarceration. He says, "I, I appeal to you, to um, be completely humble and gentle so that you can be worthy of this calling. That's what he said. So that's where we're going today. So here's the beginning of the first beatitude. You've heard me teach on it. But um, we become eventually deeply convicted or convinced that Jesus is our all in all and we must have him as the source and the center of our life. The poor in spirit, those I've always taught it, blessed are those who know they need God. But... I felt like the Lord was saying, that's good initially. But now I'm taking you to another level of poor in spirit. And that is is that you become convinced internally that He is your all in all. And that then 
turns you different, greatly, greater into the kingdom. You begin to walk in the culture of the kingdom of God even greater because it says, for theirs is the what? The kingdom of heaven. Well, we say, well, we're born again and we are born again by recognizing that we need God. The best thing that can happen to a human being is be put in a place where they know they need God. That's the best place it can ever be because that opens the kingdom. But as you grow in this, as it were, knowing, convinced, that without him you can do nothing. But it now is not a doctrine. It's, it's a power from heaven into your inner man, into your inner heart, that you know that God is your all in all and without him you can do nothing and that he is the source of everything good and he is yours and you partake of him like a child. He says the whole kingdom opens up to you. You can live in two realms at once. You can have fellowship with the saints of God according to Hebrews 12, which I've taught on for a long time. You can enter into the kingdom of God. You can enter into the city of the living God. You can go up to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. You can have interaction with angels. All of this is the heavenly calling. Okay? But it starts out, humility, you know that you need God. I like this term. We become deeply convinced Jesus is our all in all. And we must have him as the source and center of our life. And we're able to drink of him. Verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn. And I told you that word mourn is used interchangeably in Matthew 9, 15. Right in there when Jesus talks about fasting. And he was basically saying, they cannot fast, they cannot mourn. But when I leave, they will. They will mourn and they will fast. And they will find me in power. And, uh, but the mourning... Here, it seems to go a little bit deeper this time that I was uh, getting it. It says that we mourn and we grieve over what we have yielded to that kept us from partaking of him. In this, he comforts us and moves us deeper into the blessed life. We, we go from just, oh, you know, I'm sorry that I was a sinner or that I used to hate women or, you know, I spoke evil of my parents or whatever it is, you know, that we come into this uh, um, you know, the new birth and, you know, get rid of our old stuff and doing drugs or doing this or whatever. But it goes deeper now. The Lord's going to, let's go to another level where it says that we mourn and grieve over what we have yielded to that kept us from partaking of Him. I um, believe that's a, a major key that when we begin to see and the Holy Spirit begins to touch our conscience that this is not right. This is, this, it says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. See? So he gives us that mourning. There's a godly sorrow that leads to true repentance. And so there comes a place in this mourning that we are what? Comforted. My wife teaches this so beautifully. You know, take, go to Jesus when you're in sin. Go to Jesus when you're messed up. Go Because then you get to experience the mercy and grace of God. That's what I would say to anybody. When you're struggling, go to the Lord. Well, I'm upset with the Lord. Tell the Lord you're upset, but go to him anyway. Just go to the Lord. And wait there long enough until your soul, which is the unrenewed part of you, begins to be transformed enough to where your spirit will take hold of God. That's the biggest transformational little introductory thing I ever learned by God. I'd have to wait on him. I'd usually pray in tongues, listen to some good Christian music, gentle music, and it would cause my mind to get rid of the anxiety so forth and so on, and my spirit could take hold of God. Usually I'd cry, but I would get sensitive and tender where then I experienced God in that moment of need. That's the truth. Hundreds of times, and you know it probably better than I do. Okay, so it says here that we become into the deeper life. Uh, every time we admit we are wrong, he gently cleanses us and says, let's definitely move on deeper into the blessed life. Every time that we admit that we're wrong in that state of mourning, sorry that I did it, but it's a godly sorrow, not a guilt. We're not into guilt. We're into a godly sorrow. Lord, I'm sorry I've grieved you by the way I'm driving. I'm sorry I grieved you by what I've been meditating on the last 10 minutes or what I've been thinking at the last few minutes, you know. Why do I need to just go to gravitate toward a negative thought about somebody? What good is that for me or for you? I know that you don't do that, but, you know, I don't like that person, but I want to have your love for that person. Then he goes, oh, I can comfort you with that. I can teach you that. I can impart myself to you with that, see? So that's where we're going with mourning. He will comfort you. 
Now we come down to verse 5, which is what I was alluding to earlier. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now this is amazing because Moses had more power and authority on earth, or I should say the Lord used him more power because it's God who has the power. But I mean, you know, the, the, the sea split, right? The Red Sea split, that's not bad, you know. The earth swallowed up this guy and his family and his two buddies who were speaking against Moses and God. I mean, just the earth swallowed up. Boom. Whoa, that's pretty amazing, you know. Plus, you know, all the supernatural ways that God provided for the people in the wilderness, it was through Moses. And uh, so Moses, the meekness of Moses, caused God to send supernatural power through this man. I mean, he met with God in a cloud. That's, you know... It's amazing what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3. He says, you know, Moses, he had the fading glory. I want to say, dude, I don't even know any Christian that's even had the fading glory like Moses. Nobody's even close, bro. You start having a cloud in your house every morning, you know what I mean? Call me. I will be there. We'll ta- we'll, in fact, you know, we'll tell the church to meet at your house. You follow? I mean, come on. But Paul says something like, Paul, wait, 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 wait a minute, Paul. And Paul was saying that's a fading glory. We have a, fa- a glory that will not fade. And then he says that there's a place where we can get before God to where we have unveiled faces. What? What? How? Tell me. How? You know. And uh, so Paul's, Paul enters into this. You know, there's the outer court, the inner court, the holy of holies. Paul was speaking from a holy of holies encounter with God. He lived there in the most holy place. And that's where we're going. We want to go. Now, here we are, back to verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. As the reason I mention those supernatural encounters with um, Moses and the earth is how is, it, how is the earth going to react to you who have inherited it? You may be able to say to that mountain, be moved, and it, be, it might, might be even easy. I don't know. I don't know what it means. You could go to some place and say, dig here. Go to Africa, dig there. Here's a well. God's got perfect water over here that's never been used. You might go to some place. I mean, I don't know, but the earth is going to yield to those who have inherited it. Does this make sense? So the, the thing is, I don't know where this can go. You know, All I know is, uh, you'll inherit the earth. People say, well, it's during the millennium. You know, Well, Jesus said a shed. It's only, you know, by the way, You know, he said this 2,000 years ago. He goes, you know, it'll be over 2,000 years ago, but, you know, just remember I said it. If that's the way it is, I mean, what the heck, why am I even preaching this stuff? But we can be meek now because he's in us. That's the whole point, right? The meekness comes from the Lord. That's what we want. And the earth will yield. That's exactly what Revelation 12 talks about. It says the earth yielded and swallowed up the, the terrible stuff coming out of the dragon's mouth and protected the woman. So there's something about meekness we haven't uh, tapped into. Okay, uh, let's see now. Let's go on down to uh, chapter or verse 6. It says here, Blessed are they who hunger and what? Thirst for what? Now, this is amazing that righteousness comes from the Lord, the Lord our righteousness. But this righteousness that comes from God is a gift of the Lord but it also comes to us through Jesus Christ according to uh, Philippians 1, 9 through 11. But this is the verse that came to me. Did I give you Romans uh, 16? Oh, goody. Let's look at Romans 16, 19 through 20. I want you to see this. This says what happens, and the same thing will happen, blessed are the peacemakers. Um, everyone has heard about your, ob- your uh, obedience, so I rejoice because... Um, you, I rejoice, see, it's a little hard, for your, what does it say, for your what? Because of you. Oh, sorry. And your, what, what's it say after that? But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about evil. Sorry, from this angle, I see a star there. It's that light. About what is good, uh, right? What is good and innocent about what is evil. So that's righteousness, you understand? Now, what's going to happen when you live a righteous life? Next verse. The God of what? We're going to go into peace in just a minute. It's the next part of the Beatitudes. But when you live a righteous life, God will do something. The God of peace will soon what? Crush 
Satan beneath your feet. The grace of our Lord be with you. What I'm telling you is this. I know that there's, particularly in the 70s when we got saved, there was so much about the end times coming, the Antichrist coming is going to be terrible. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But if you're living a righteous life, imparted righteousness by the gift of Jesus Christ, and you are growing in that righteousness, the God of peace will bruise the devil beneath your feet. Where do we see that in Scripture? It's very clear in chapter 12 of Revelation. There was a group of people that were born, it says, and travailed into sonship, into maturity. They were caught up and Satan could not accuse them. The accuser of their brethren, you know, spoke against them day and night. But God says, no, I've got a people who you cannot accuse. They are sanctified wholly through me. And I'm going to bruise them beneath your feet. And Michael comes along with those people and Satan is cast down to the earth. Most people would say it's the beginning of the, trans- of the tribulation. I would say yes. And by the way, it's the beginning of, of Satan's fall. And he comes down to earth in the, book, in the, Reb- in the um, tribulation as a fallen, dethroned angel. And those who are with Christ are seated above. It makes a huge difference about how we look at the end times. But that's another story. But I've taught on it many times, and hopefully, you know, you'll begin to see that. But anyway, and, and grow in it like I'm growing in it. So the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now go back now to chapter 5, verse 6. And I just want to say that living a, a righteous life, it says here... Um, Uh, You hunger to be like him, to live a righteous life, a life worthy of Jesus' sacrifice for us. We now come to a place of something else. As we enter into a greater dimension of righteousness, what does it thrust us into? Are you ready? The next verse. Blessed are the what? This is the progression. Jesus said, you must know that you need me. Boom, you enter in. You must know that you must be meek and tender-hearted and so forth. Yes, righteous and so forth. Now, we're living, he's imparting more and more of his righteousness. Now, now you begin, are you ready? Love begins to dominate you. No casting stones. There's way too much hatred with those with a microphone. The hate speech is way over the top. Do not be a part of it. No I'm believing for everyone who hates me or hates God or anything else. I want to be able to love my enemies. I want to be able to be merciful toward everybody. Because I need mercy. I need mercy. We all need mercy, but sometimes the way that we drive. You know, sometimes the way that we think, you know. Blessed. So now what happens is after you are imparted righteousness... The love of God begins to um, start to take over. You begin to be renewed. And it leads into something else, which is maybe the greatest thing that could ever happen to anybody. Now you come to the place where mercy triumphs, where love used to be withheld. A new freedom from self is now yours. There's something about the mercy of God that, um, you know, many people, and I I agree with preaching faith about healing, but you know, that isn't how a lot of people got healed in the Bible. When blind Bartimaeus and Timotheus were blind, they didn't say, Jesus, you know, or, you know, I believe in you. They said, Jesus, have mercy on me. Called him, what do you want? We want to be healed. We want to be. We want to. Our, our, we want. We want to see. Go. But they ask for one thing. I don't know how much faith they had. Maybe they had faith. I don't know. But they ask for mercy. Stop Jesus in his tracks. Get that guy over here. See what I mean? So now we're becoming more and more like the Lord. We're living a righteous life. We're living a holy life. And now we find ourselves being merciful. Next verse, oh my gosh, I wonder what it leads us into. Our hearts being purified by the love of God, and now we're beginning to see the Lord. What I mean by seeing the Lord, did you have a vision of the Lord last night, Pastor? Not necessarily, but you know what? I can see God in your eyes. 
Yeah, you do. I mean, I hope you see that. I started seeing it years ago. I'm sure that you do. You see it in a baby's eyes. You can see God when you walk outside. Look at that beautiful flowers or whatever. Look at this. Look at the sky. Look at the mountains. I see God every day in our granddaughter. It's just amazing. You know, who could make, who could make anything so cute as a little girl or a little boy? Nobody. I've never seen it. Michelangelo couldn't do it. Beautiful, greatest sculptor in the whole world, whatever, and the greatest, you know, artist, who knows, whatever. But now, now, somewhere along the line, you begin to perceive and see God. The term means not just see Him like, I see you right here, but you begin to perceive Him. You begin to have on the mind of Christ. You begin to partake of the nature of Christ. You begin to perceive His attitudes and His issues. The Holy Spirit is able to navigate you into the river of life. You are now entering into a greater dimension of the blessed life. Blessed is everyone who does these things that Jesus Christ is mentioning here. This may be, I don't know, but it may be the greatest teaching in the Holy Bible. I don't know. But all I know is it leads us into maturity of sonship. It leads us into a life, yes, where there'll be persecution. But he says, you will be the light of the world. I will set you as a city upon a hill. And when they see all your good works, you'll glorify my Father. That's what you're called to. Every one of you, everybody, is called to do good works that glorify God Almighty. Amen. Along with persecutions, who cares? You're seeing God. You know, Stephen was stoned, right? He saw God. He could care less. I don't know if he felt a rock or a stone on his head or not. I have no idea. He says, I see God. And he was just a new believer, relatively speaking, but he was filled with faith and the Holy Spirit. But we are, most of us, some of us are a lot older than he ever got to be. But God is moving in these last days to prepare himself a bride. And it's right down the narrow road of life called the Beatitudes. The transforming power of the Beatitudes of God. Now we've lived somewhat imparted righteousness. We are merciful. Now our hearts are purified enough to see God who is love. If we're not preaching God of love. Now, I fear God, don't get me wrong. Hell's real, right? When you get close to God, you know, you find out how good and tender he is. That's it. That's it. You know, just the other night, I, I said this early morning because I felt it was going to just, I want it to be for everybody here. Maybe many of you have had this. But it was like, the, the, uh, it was the middle of the night and I believe the, somewhere, all I know is, is that Jesus was revealing the Father to me. And it was like I got a glimpse of him. I could see Jesus, but I was just getting a glimpse of it. And I was laying there, and just tears start coming. And, I, and this was what happened to me. I want to live a life that pleases God. That's it. That, that was it. It's like, you know, he was powerful. I shook, you know. No, just tears coming down in the middle of the night. I want to live a life that pleases God. That was, my, that was my experience. I want to live a life, Father, that pleases you and Jesus who you gave for me. That was where I was at on this. And uh, it was, you know, thank God. So anyway, the next one down now. Watch this now. This is very amazing. And I really had to pray about this. I thought, what is this? Now, again, this translation is wrong. Blessed are the what? Peacemakers, for they will be called the what? It's the word weos, H-U-I-O-S. It means full mature sons and daughters of God. Now, I've been asking the Lord, I don't know what this means. What does it mean? He says, last night, like Pam said, what does it mean? I said, I don't know. I've been asking him. I don't get it. Like a peacemaker. It's like, you know, police are peacemakers to bring peace to it, you know. Um, you know, after the end of a war, you know, people have peace and all that. But he was saying to me, look, Rick, I am the prince of peace. And you come under my peace. You know, in many of the epistles, Paul, particularly Peter as well, they would say, blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be yours. Grace and peace be yours. Grace. God's blessing and ability to encourage and strengthen you. Peace. Peace? I live in L.A. Are you kidding me? Peace. On the freeway? You know? But peace. There's something about peace that probably we're missing. But he said, I'm the Prince of Peace. And you come under that. You're steady as a rock. The God of peace is the one who bruises Satan beneath your feet. 
Jesus is not moved by anything that's going on in the sense that he, emotionally he's involved, he's concerned about all the people that are going through hard times, don't get me wrong. But he has this sense of peace in the midst of a storm. Now that storm was real when they were on that sea of Galilee. And Peter and them, they knew this is like, this is something else. Lord, we're going to die. We've never been on anything like this. Jesus said, peace, be still. You will be able to do that at times. Because you're under the direct line of the Prince of Peace. What I'm trying to tell you is, if you allow God to break you, which is what 5.3 is all about, He will conform you into His Son right down this road that I'm preaching today which is the straight and narrow road to life. That's what I'm preaching. But this here, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of the living God. There's something about it that I still don't get. Maybe I'll get more this week. But you're going to come under the direct authority of the Prince of Peace, who brings peace into a situation. In these last days, would it be amazing to go to Puerto Rico and be able to, by the power of God, to bring peace. Wouldn't that be amazing? Or to go into the inner cities of Chicago, where they're killing themselves faster at twice the rate of the young men that were originally killed the first 10 years in Afghanistan. And you would be able to, I don't know how, under the authority of the Prince of Peace, bring such conviction of sin and hatred for drugs and alcohol and violence and all that, that the peace of God would rest over it the birds would come back into the city and sing. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, why should we limit ourselves when we are connected to and the the invisible, unlimited God Almighty is living in us and He's saying, give me more room. The Beatitudes, this is the blessed life. Give me more room. I'm bigger than anything and everything in the whole world. Everything is submitted fully to me. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the full mature sons and daughters of the living God. Now watch this. Verse 10, blessed are they which suffer persecution for righteousness sake. Amen. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. Let them call us whatever they want. Don't be affected by it. Amen. Bless them. Bless those who curse us. What do we care? Next verse. Blessed blessed shall you be when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you because or for my name's sake Falsely they say it, as it were, because you're like me, for my sake, for my name's sake, it usually says. Next verse. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets which were before you. Amen. Rejoice. We're all freaked out about stuff. Just rejoice. You're counted worthy. You're actually living a righteous life. Hallelujah. You're a light in the darkness. Amen. Besides, they're going to come around. Now, next verse. You are the salt of the earth. Now watch this. He just takes them through the Beatitudes and he says, now you're the preserving agent of the earth. In those days, no refrigerators and so forth. Everybody knows they use salt, right? They use salt to preserve things, to make stuff taste better. You're the God flavors in the earth. You're the ones who are causing the earth and things to not rot. You're the the salt of the earth. Now watch this. It gets very serious in just one moment. Jesus is amazing. He can say something, you just go, wahoo! And the next moment you can go, oh my Lord and my God. How serious is this? Which is one of these verses here. So you are the salt of the earth. Uh, But if the salt loses its savor, if you break away from me, I'm the one who's imparting all this to you, wherewith shall it be salted again? It's good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. Now most people say this, and that's only one interpretation, but they say trodden under the feet means that they threw it out on the streets and so forth, which they did when the salt lost its savor. But, or into the highways, whatever terms you want to use it, but, a lot, of, a lot of people will say, that means an invasion of war. They'll just trample you. Which is exactly what Jesus prophesied in Luke 19. If you want to look at that, Luke 19, 40. Anyway, now he says this. Now, now he says, you are the light of the world. Now, you can understand, and we, we've heard this many times, but people will sometimes say, you're the light of the world. Everybody go, yahoo, yahoo. 
Not if you haven't partaken of and understand, as it were, and God does it even when we don't understand it, but it's the Beatitudes, that's the blessed life that makes you the light of the world. It's, it's a, this is a conditional statement on what he said prior to that that makes you the light of the world. And you are the light of the world. But, you know, we go from a 10-watt bulb to a 20-watt bulb. When we get to be a 30-watt bulb, man, we think we've arrived. No, go on to 40. Go on to 50. You know what I'm saying? Smith Wigglesworth, English plumber, on a train, typical of him, walks down the aisle. Men and women would say, Sir, you have convicted me of sin. He carried the name of the Lord like Paul, like Peter, and like you. To whatever degree that you die to self and let him live and become your life. That's where we're going. That's the only, only place we're going. You are the light of the world, a city. Oh, okay, now he wants to raise you up to make you a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. In other words, it's impossible for God not to go public eventually with his kids. Cannot be hidden. He's not going to allow anything to hide his power and love, his gentleness, his meekness, his tenderness, his, uh, what do we say, his peace, his mercy, you know. He's not going to let anything hide that. He's going to raise you up. Yes. He's going to do it. That's what he wants to do. But he wants you to be the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Now watch this. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. No way. But on a candlestick. So it gives light to all that are in the house. Amen. You're going to raise you up. Period. Let your light so shine before men that they may see what? This is where true evangelism comes, I think. When we do good works, we're professional, we're loving, we're kind, we're a good neighbor, we're generous, people see us as somebody who they can trust, whatever. But there are works that we are called to do, you are called to do. I love it again, Ephesians 2.10, for you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, in God, with the elements of God. It's like these are true, genuine parts of heaven, you understand? We are his poem created in Christ with only heavenly ingredients, divine, created in Christ unto good works which he hath before ordained. So that's where you want to go. I always preach this verse a lot. Well, occasionally I do. I love it. You want to do those ordained works when you become like Christ. When you become mature. As you go up, and I believe there are levels of this, you know, but he wants to get you to a place. We're supposed to, the preachers are supposed to, along with the mercy and grace of God and all that, are to bring you to the fullness of the stature of Christ. Who? What's your job? Jesus, I'm getting on my knees right now. You know, I'm responsible for that. Oh, oh my gosh, I'm not even there myself, Lord. You know, and I don't know anybody in the earth that is. But that's his calling on everybody. I have a high calling. People tell me, oh, you know, this person has a high calling. Everybody's got a high calling. Are you kidding? It's going to become like Jesus. It, it was so ridiculous in the early days. Pastor, this person's going through hell, but they have such a high, high calling. So after a while, I was like, wait, wait a minute. We're, we all have a high calling. We're all called to be living in the heavenly places, living in two dimensions at once, having a face-to-face -face encounter with God, that your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Now, here it is. Are you ready? This is where Jesus is going with this whole thing. He wants his Father to be glorified through you. That's where he's going. Well, Jesus, you know, I want, I, no, this is what I want. I want you guys to become like me, and I want you to glorify the Father, that people can see God. That's where he's going. So I, I think that's pretty good, don't you? Oh, yeah, look at, you've got Geneva up there. This is the Geneva Bible that Betsy had to change it today. 1599. It was a Geneva Bible that was the light of the world that brought in to Europe, the living word of God in their own language. Geneva Bible, 1599. But in 1611, King James 
uh, took, uh, they say, about 90% of the translation and used it for his King James. And he took out all the footnotes that said that, you know, that government came from God and not from man. That's why their cry when they left Europe was, no king but Jesus. Yeah, that, that was their cry. So, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's your calling. That's your calling. What am I supposed to do? I don't know what God's will is for me. That's what it is. But you must now cooperate with when you come to a place where you need God. Oh, this is another time for me to enter in deeper into being poor in spirit, which is the first beatitude that leads me into the influence of the kingdom of God. Then I go through a season of mourning and seeing how stupid I was, and then God comforts me. You know, what was the other one? What was number three or four now? Then I go through, you know, uh, that was four. Then I go through learning to be meek and gentle and so forth. And an inheritance comes, some part, of something from the earth. Let's just pray. Okay, here we go. Take a deep breath. <laughs> Say this. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, let it be done unto me according to your word. Just like Mary. All I can say is, let this word become real to me, experientially, into my spirit, soul, and body. Amen. Okay, we've got a few minutes. I just want to wait on God. Christina, why don't you just kind of twiddle there. And uh, I just want to pray. And sometimes you, ladies and gentlemen, have been so brilliant on succinctly repeating uh, and you do a better job than I do. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. You know, anyway, what we do is we wait on God. Sometimes we get prophecies, but I, if the Lord has something to clarify or something that you learned or something that you got a revelation of that was imparted to you that can encourage others, I want you to have the freedom to do that. So we'll wait on the Lord. Lord, this has been so helpful in the past. Thank you for your beautiful, beautiful, beautiful children who you are making the light of the world. And it ain't no joke. And I pray you bless them. Amen. So we'll wait on the Lord. You know, um, a brief, brief story. During Katrina, uh, the guy Nagin was the um, uh, mayor of uh, Louisiana, of uh, New Orleans. And uh, he said, I, I don't really like President Bush very much, but he sent down General so-and-so. This guy was an African-American general with a French name, you know. I, I can't remember who, what his name was. But he said, when that man came down, he set everybody in order. And he said, that's when things really started happening for us. When General I can't pronounce his name. I saw him the other day on the, they were talking to him about uh, uh, Houston. And, um, but uh, he said, when that man was sent down, man, everybody snapped too. Hallelujah. Right? Amazing. He had authority, but it was peace. Nobody argued with this guy. This is what we're going to do. The Prince of Peace. You know, I must say, even when I was preaching today, but it hit me before, if I'm merciful, it leads me right into being able to see God. That was the thing that got me. It's like, okay, wow. If I'll be merciful, I'll see God. So it must purify our eyes to be merciful, to be tender-hearted. Now you'll begin to see God. Wow just blesses me so let's stand up and let you guys go so Lord you're awesome you're beautiful these are your beautiful children wow you're beautiful beautiful children they're your beautiful children yeah they're these are your beautiful children here in October 2017 Hollywood, California, a major area of 
unclean things and yet incredible promise that you promised us here. You would appear to the woman at the well. You're going to come back to L.A. again, just like Brother Seymour said, in about a hundred years. The glory of God would come even greater. So help us walk out the Beatitudes. Help us understand the progression. And then I think we start all over again. I, honestly, I believe he told me every seven years you start over again. I go through it all and you increase and then you go back again. Because you, you can never get to a place where you're so spiritual that you don't think you need God. So you always go back to the beginning, right? So anyway, Lord, I love these people, your kids. Thank you so much for your incredible mercy and grace. Let's just pray this together. Um, you know, well, I guess we have, we have ministry team today. Yes, we do. Are, are you leading it? Okay, come on up, Manny. Let's just uh, grab hands and pray for the people on your left and your right. Lord, I pray for you to enter into us with your living word. That these beatitudes would become the, the arrow that, that hits the target in our hearts. That we know that you want to make us more merciful and tender hearted and all these good things. Thank you so much for Manny, Lord. And Irene, we pray for your blessing upon them and the ministry team today. Amen. Bless those people next to you, Lord. We pray you bless the person on our right and on our left to become more and more like Jesus, to be used supernaturally of God. Amen.